Hello and welcome to a new episode of When Power Podcast. I'm here today with Latanya Mapfred, former president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women, a public foundation that supports courageous activists who are fighting for justice and equality in their communities, and current and future CEO of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. We are here today to have a conversation on leadership, feminism, and her book, The Everyday Feminist. So welcome, Latanya, and thank you very much for being with us today on When Power Podcast. Oh my God, it's such a pleasure. I just love the name of the podcast. I was I was all in when I saw that. So thank you for having me. I know this is going to be a very interesting conversation. I, I like to take you straight into it with a question that I ask all my guests and is what is that you fighting for today? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I, I have to tell you, I am um, trying really, really hard to continue to fight for um, just a little bit better of a world to live in. Um, and I, you know, and it's it's been interesting for me to think about what 2024 will hold and with all the changes that I've made. Um, and, you know, and one of those things is that we shouldn't have to fight so hard, but if we're gonna fight, then God knows when I leave this world, I want it to be just a little bit better than where I found it. And so for me, it is this continuous, you know, small step by step perseverance that is required in order to get us to um, to something that looks more like equity and equality and less like um, division and war. Um, and even if that's just a tiny, tiny step, then that's what I'm going to fight for this year and every year that I have left on this earth. Well, this is uh, just by hearing this, I'm already feeling empowered and so powerful that uh, we have a woman like you fighting a fight like this. And I'm so happy to amplify your story through this podcast. And for all the people that are following us today, I would like them to know you a little bit uh, better. What is also behind a bio that they might read online about yourself. Yeah. So uh, tell me, who is Latania and how? Um, where do you find the strength and the motivation to show up every day and what inspired you to pursue a career in advocating for women, women's rights and gender equality? You know, it's, um, thank you for, for the question. It's, um, I never really thought about it as, um, as more of like a motivation. It was more just like, um, my duty, you know, it's like when you wake up in the morning and it's like, you, you have to be thankful because you woke up this morning, you know? So in my, my world, it's like, it's not just about, I'm um, working for so social justice. It is just the air that I breathe. It is if if I don't, who will? And if it, um, and if it's not a part of what I bring to the profession, you know, whether it's a lawyer, a human rights advocate, um, you know, a feminist, then um, what is it worth um, if I can't be who I am? Uh, in this work, in these movements. And so for me, um, growing up with the, the you know, I always talk about my grandparents, you know, my grandmothers were strong forces. Um, my sister just talked about it uh, over the over the holiday break as um, I have both of them in me, you know, one grandparent who, uh, you know, my, my Nana is very soft and, um, you know, humble and, um, and, and, you know, everybody loves her because she gives hugs and um, she, 
she cooks for you, she bakes for you. And then I have another grandmother who is, you know, much more of a stronger entrepreneur, has gone through a lot of things in her her life, um, particularly um, racism in the U.S. Um, and how she's had to navigate that for her and her children. So she's much more staunch. She's a businesswoman. Um, you know, she gets up at a certain time of day. She achieves this, you know, and that success is what drove her. Um, and, and my sister said, I have both of those things in me. And that combination is what makes me um, who I am. But I, I will say the inspiration for the everyday feminist, I, you know, I had this, you know, a beautiful opportunity um, to work both for the United Nations and then as a foreign service officer with USAID, which allowed me then to live in, you know, I, to live in 15 countries, but visit many more um, across four continents. And it meant that I was able to meet in every single one of those countries, the most amazing women fighting for gender justice. And as you know, every country is has different issues that they're fighting for at different times. And so to be able to reflect on that in this book, The Everyday Feminist, what women were doing, whether it was in Iraq or Sudan or in the US, um, you know, how that affected the work that I was doing and how it actually supported um, an agenda that puts me where I am today, you know, whether that's at Global Fund for Women or now at Rockefeller Philanthropies. And so that that inspiration um, you can't pay for, right? It's it's um it's just being in the company of women who want to, again, do just a little bit to make their families better, their communities better. And that inspires me because I, I know that. I feel that. I, I want that too. And so it's easy to lift up there, just like you're doing, to lift up their stories, to lift up the experiences we had in a small fight to make something just a little bit better wherever we were in the world. Mm -hmm. I, I well, I agree, and I and I think the more women I interview, the more I realize uh, the inspiration and the people we are today lies in our roots, whether it's yeah. grandmothers, mothers, and it's always you know on the woman side of the family there is always these strong personalities that shape us into the women that we are today, and I think yeah. it's it's beautiful that we live up to what they gave us, not just you know in terms of DNA, but also ideas and the courage to fight for, for something that has a meaning, you know? And, right. and, yeah. and as you say, even traveling around and meeting a lot of inspiring women, uh, as a journalist myself, I've done, I done that quite a lot. And mm. I I don't know, I don't even, I'm not even able to count all the inspiration yeah. stories that I heard. That's and, right. And I, that's I don't, a blessing. That's exactly, such a blessing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, when they say that your network is your network, but yes. in, in this case, it's also your inspiration and the reason why you do what you do every day and you have exactly. the, the energy and the passion to get out of bed. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Really yeah. Completely. And it sounds like you, I don't know if you have kids yet, but it's like I have an 18 year old and a 20. 24 year old. And right now, I mean, you know, there's years of, you know, of course, the little years, the middle years, the older years, the college. Um, but right now, my, you know, my real emphasis with them is find your passion, find the thing that makes you get up in the morning, and you don't feel like you're going to work, but that this is what you do. This is a part of what you do. Um, and you just want to be able to do as much as you can to meet the mission of the day. So hopefully, I, I know I can hear it in your voice. Um, it's certainly how I get through every day. And I just hope that more and more of us in the world are focused on um, that, what I call feminist spirit of just, you know, struggling for justice um, wherever you can find it. Exactly, exactly. Mm. I don't have kids yet, but mm. I I consider my community as a sort yes. of like expanded family. And if yes. I, whenever I speak with a younger journalist, or even just, you know, a younger woman, what I what I like to say is exactly what you say, just, uh, you know, get out of bed for something you really love. And yes. a, a job is a job, but you, you really need to find a motivation, something much more deeper than, you know, just going. That's out. right do a that's nine to right. five in the office and then bring home the salary okay that's that's uh honorable as well but uh there is yes. much more that we can do and we can achieve i think sometimes when when we all talk about who inspires us what inspires us i think sometimes we're thinking about you know these um you know these sort of lightning bolt charismatic leaders right you know these ones who find themselves on tv and everywhere um uh, and, and our big influencers in our world. But I have to tell you, the stories that I write about in the book and the way that, and the people that I even think about when, when I'm having this conversation with you, 
they're they're not that, you know. Um, they're much more relatable. I mean, incredibly imperfect, like all of us. Um, you know, they're human, um, and they're um, you know what what we call ordinary women, but they have this extraordinary commitment to mm. working towards some kind of change. And they are the ones who are showing up and like pushing forward and really getting the hard stuff done. Um, and and I feel like um, we need to lift that up more. I mean, you know, yes, I love Oprah. I love, you know, so many different people right now who are doing amazing things. But um, I think it's the it's the it's the women who are in these communities um, who are not showing up in social media feeds that. Um, sometimes I think we forget. And that's why I really appreciate what you're doing by, you know, lifting those voices up. I think our children um, and hopefully their children need to be able to see themselves in mm. our influencers and not feel like they need to change themselves to be um, an influencer or someone that inspires others. Yeah, I I 100% agree with what you just said. And we were talking about this before, but even the people that follow Empower, they know it's all about mm. bringing stories of ordinary women that are changing the world. And sometimes mm. too often they are forgotten, but uh, they are doing amazing things and they are there on the ground fighting every day in, in, in different countries for different reasons. And they deserve an opportunity to be heard. And I think sometimes we are very, um, what we see on social media, on TV, it's, really superficial it doesn't really talk to everyone and you don't feel like yes. you have a connection but the story that you wrote uh, about in the book which I have by the way I bought it and yes. I loved it from first page to the last one are really relatable and they're really applicable yes. for you know for everyone if you just want to actively That's make right. a change and it's not uh, you know something too far away from our imaginary or from our lived experience so that's um, right yeah. yeah that's what brought <laughs> us here today to to have this conversation because I, I believe there is a very very big alignment in terms of mission and 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 you know values and passion um yes. we will talk about your your book a little bit uh okay. later um we can keep a bit of suspense as well for the, <laughs> for the people listening to yes. us um so um, you wore different hats and you had different roles and responsibilities uh, and you must have also encountered some challenges across your careers and obviously um, the mission of advancing women right globally is not an easy one. So um, would you like to share maybe how you keep yourself motivated or how you uh, face the, some of the challenges that you have, might have to face in, in your roles and uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I, I I think back to when I first started a young lawyer, human rights officer at the UN um, in countries where being a woman and especially being a young woman um, and then in particular, a young black woman was probably not like uh, what people were expecting when I walked into many rooms. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it was a little bit, um, it was a little bit difficult to uh, get people to listen to me to um, to be able to be in the right conversations in order to make change happen. Uh, you know, and I, you know, you can imagine that's me working at the United Nations. Imagine these women in countries uh, where their own leadership will not listen to them about things that's happening in their community. Um, and I, I felt like these, you know, these challenges were, um, I could overcome them, but I did oftentimes need to have the, the comfort of the sisterhood. I think that's the thing that um, has made it work. And so it, it is always having this group of, a small group of women who, uh, and, and, and intergenerationally for me, that's been how I've been inspired. So, you know, usually it's an older woman that would advise me and then a couple that are my age who are going through similar things, leaders in their own groups, maybe not in the same sector, but then also having some young people who were fearless and, you know, didn't even understand what I was talking about. You know, um, that has always been for me, wherever I move, um, been extremely helpful and getting through. I think sometimes it's lonely when you start rising in some of these organizations as well. So I've had to use that same template, if that makes sense. Um, when I move into like CEO and you know executive director positions is to make sure that I have people around me who will tell me the truth, who will advise me when I don't know what to do, 
who will keep me up when I'm feeling down and who will keep me real, you know, like, you know, not tell me lies about, um, about whether I'm doing okay or showing up enough or doing things that are actually helping. And so for me, that has been the way to get through challenges is to do it in community. Um, and I, I I see, you know, how lonely it can get, not just for myself, but for other uh, leaders, women leaders, and how they have to bat against some of the misinformation. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about the, the former president or was she prime minister of New Zealand, um, mm -hmm. Jacinta and like how incredibly lonely that must have been for someone that was just so incredibly effective at her job and then to step down because you really need to focus on what's really important for you. I've been there at those times when I've had to make choices for family um, that I, you know, was just kind of annoyed that my male counterparts didn't have to make those same kind of choices. Right. You know, so yeah. it's, it's been, um, it's been a, it's been a wonderful ride, let's just say, but not without its challenges because of, you know, my race, my sex, my age, you know, and those are the things that I want to make better for those that are coming behind us, right? So that they don't have to um, make those same kind of choices and or that they can bust through those glass ceilings without feeling any problem, knowing that there's going to be sisters on both sides that are going to help them get through. Mm -hmm. Community is a is a thread in this beginning of 2024. I don't know for you, it, it always has been, but there is a lot of talks yeah. happening yeah. on the importance of community acknowledging you know the support that we receive from our teams even in our corporate jobs or uh companies Absolutely. it's we we can, couldn't make it on our own you know we need the support of the of the network of the people around us so really important That's to right. to remember this and you know what else the network does? It reminds you, because like when we were starting this year, I mean, a lot of us are just looking at the trouble of the world, right? You know, the things happening in Gaza and Sudan and, and other parts. I mean, hell, I, you know, I'm in Memphis where the gun crime mm -hmm. is like, insane. Um, everybody has a gun, everybody. Um, so, you know, the, that's kind of, we can get caught on that or we can look, you know, at the broader structure. Uh, someone, um, one of my colleagues from Atlanta sent me uh, an email that talked about, and you may have seen this, uh, you know, this little meme, but it's uh, what, has, what is getting better for women in the world? What is not getting worse in the world? <laughs> <laughs> and where there are some opportunities to change things. And so when you sit in a little bubble and you don't look broader, it, it may look very much like we're in a really, really bad situation. But then when you look broader, you're like, well, things are changing. Um, there are some really good things happening around the world, things a lot to celebrate. And so for 2024, I'm really trying to lean into, you know, that version of the story because it keeps me moving hmm. forward. Yeah. Yeah. And talking about leadership, um, as a leader, what do you think are the qualities that are essential for driving positive change, especially when we talk about women's right field? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I, I do, um, you know, I'm, I'm one of those and I'm going to take you back a little bit because, you know, the, I'm in the U.S. and we're looking at this potential um, candidacy of Trump again. Um, and remembering that he won his first, he won, you know, his presidency against a female candidate. Um, and what, what was even worse was that the, the thing that tipped him into the, uh, into a successful win was the, the, the white woman vote here in the United yeah. States. I mean, not to say, you know, white men voted for him, but we mm -hmm. expected him to have a large white male followership, what was unexpected. And, and, you know, and Black folks just certainly, you know, uh, voted for for Hillary Clinton in big ways. I think the Black woman vote was close to like 98.9% for Hillary. But that really got me, you know, this, um, this, this, like, th it was a white woman running and white women didn't, you know, you know, fully support her. It was a, a large, um, it was just boggling, you know, mind boggling to me. And so when I think about how we need to really uh, move forward is I think there has to be some understanding of uh, how we look at ourselves, because I don't think it's just a matter of, um, you know, oh, they found the other candidate better. I think there is some, and I could be wrong, but I think there is something about what women are taught about who they are 
that we need to work on. And so I, and, and the power that women who actually know themselves and are, are fighters for social justice. I mean, you've seen it, the Me Too. I mean, we can go down the list, right? Of women who actually know themselves and have dedicated themselves to the fight for justice, how powerful they are. And that's a battle, not against the world. It's a battle against ourselves the thinking that we've been taught that we can't change the world. And so I think there's a lot of work that we have to do with ourselves and how we see ourselves fitting into a greater narrative of change, um, of peace, of prosperity, of abundance um, as the leaders. Because I, I do think that that is where it, it's, it's going to happen. And if we ourselves um, continue to think and accept that we're not worthy of a presidency or, oh, it's not, you know, you don't want a woman running the country, you know, that kind of stuff, then we're we're just going to waste time and set ourselves back so much. So I'm really thinking about how we as women actually battle, because um, you talk about what we fight for. How do we get past these narratives of us being less than hmm. um, something incredibly transformative um, so that we can do this work because um, we know we're good at it um, but we just have to be able to convince ourselves that somebody that looks like us or is similar to us can also do it because sometimes we think we can't hmm. so true uh, and and I think what is important in, in this case is representation which is something that it's truly missing and and it goes yeah. back as well to the stories that we mentioned before you know if you don't see it you think you cannot be it you 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 don't have an example of what what are the possibilities that are open for you yes. out there so um i think this plays a very important uh role in the way as well women are perceiving themselves yeah what the society the culture uh stereoty uh, stereotypes everything you know tell us like you know you cannot do that because you are a woman but actually mm. yes you can but uh, because there are examples of successful women in leadership yes. position uh, that we absolutely. should have a look up for so why not you know yes, why not absolutely i love it and <laughs> i think we all have a part to play honestly i think in the arts you know um you know, I, 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 this is, you know, I'm just thinking like, okay, so when Obama became the first black president of the United States, um, there have been numerous uh, movies where there was a black president. I, you know, whether it's true or not, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. People have to see it in order to believe it, right? And, and, and I think that has a lot to do with it. It's like how we are portrayed in certain things um how how we um how we accept you know certain words about ourselves all of that makes a difference in mm -hmm. how um how we can lead um it, it is it is very much a, a big part of how people see you and then that allows them then to trust that you will be able to lead and so I think we have to work on a lot of that stuff internally but also then how we accept what people call us what they um what they say about us how they portray us you know those are things mm. that we have to be careful of exactly and also very important not to make this an exception you know right. it happened we had a black president let's repeat that no it right. was not exactly why not yeah you know why it's amazing not? yeah Hollywood That's is right. keep doing it we have yep. examples that it is possible we lived it Absolutely. through so why not yep so I totally um, agree <laughs> <laughs> and did you have any I know that you said you uh, get your inspiration from all the women you met uh, but did you have a mentor or someone that influenced you or help you shape your leadership style and maybe what advice would you give to any younger woman or any younger leader that is mm. future leader that is listening to us today and they are thinking you know this could be an option for them well I've had several mentors in my um, career but I the you know the most recent uh was at Planned Parenthood and where Cecile Richards led that organization um I, you know, I always tell people, uh, you know, everyone knows she's a badass and she, you know, she was totally committed to disrupting the status quo. Um, and so that was beautiful. But what was even more beautiful and something that I tried to replicate was that she also showed up every week. I don't care where she was in the world. I don't care what television station she had to play on. She was at staff meeting, the, you know, the, the, the team meeting every week. Um, and so that kind of... Um, commitment to uh, not just the broader external world, but also the internal workings of an organization was something that I really admired. And I 
I literally, I mean, took notes on, you know, mm -hmm. on how you do this. Um, how do you show up, not just for the, the movement, I'll call it, but then how do you also show up for your family, for the people that work for you? And, um, and I think when you hold both of those things very dear, you can do it well. And so when I talk to younger people, because um, I don't think you can give that kind of energy to just anything, right? Mm -hmm. So again, what I was saying about my kids, it's like you have to figure out what, um, what churns your heart um, to do this. And, and if that then is a thing that you believe in and you love, uh, it's, it's going to be worth working for and you'll do it well because you want to do it well. And that, that's the energy that changes the world that we live in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> again, again, and this is another, another inspiring point. I hope people that are listening to us right now, they are taking notes because we, <laughs> we, we share some important advice here. And um, you you talk about this before, but I would like to bring again the focus on the communities and on building partnership as well. Uh, again, the field of women's rights and um, it's not it's not an easy one to to be fighting in, and it's important to to build and sustain partnership even with other organizations, governments, and stakeholders. So, how do you make sure you can maximize? Uh, the impact that you want to make through this partnership and how do you actually you know build this partnership which are fundamental for your for your work I am um, about to go on in my first 90 days with the with Rockefeller 90 days of what I think I'm calling radical listening um, we did a um, a, a, a year of learning at Global Fund for Women and to me they're they're the same thing I don't think you can um really know what to do if you're not listening to what people are are mm -hmm. trying to um to to deal with um a lot of times we think we know what the issues are and i think you have to take some time to really listen uh, the one thing i've learned by living all over the world is that the issues are not the same they're not articulated the same um, we may boil them down to like, it's a climate issue, <laughs> you know, yeah. but I've now been to do, working with movements in the Pacific, uh, working with movements in the Caribbean, working with movements in Sub Saharan Africa, and of course, in the, the communities um, of the U.S. It, it's a very different thing, what they're all working for. And unless you literally sit down and listen to what their issues are, because they may not all call it the same thing. And in fact, I think many of them for years have been calling it very different things. It's not like they just came into the climate movement. Most of these groups have been doing this work for, for decades decades because this has been happening for decades this uh, environmental degradation that you know people saw and particularly because it, it affected poor communities far before it affected others um and so from from my perspective taking the time to listen um before you before you jump um has been really really important and then distinguishing um you know what that work looks like for different communities is is so very important and those two things for me has um i feel like have helped me be able to chart a course that has profound impact um i think people look at my time at global fund for women and they're like you've done so much there and i think the only reason i was uh, able to do that is because not only was i prepared to listen in a radical way, but people were gracious enough to tell me what I needed to learn. And so I think with those two things, impact is, is guaranteed because you know now what people need and then you come with uh, hopefully some choices that they can pick up um, as, as support for them. We have what we call at Global Fund for Women, a concept of movement-led work, uh, which is a concept of trying to understand what people need when they need it so that we can get them the resources that they need and how they need it, right? So yeah. it's simple. It's very simple, but it is what impact boils down to. It's if you think you're going to create something for other people and that they're going to take that up and run with it, then I think impact looks very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but impact is the partnership. So what you're talking about is how do you make impact in a partnership? It is to partner. It is to listen. It is to learn. And it is to act together in partnership. Oh. And um, 
just a question uh, coming from this, because in uh, when it comes to NGOs, charities, uh, human rights um, fights and activism, there are so many association, organization, community, and um, it's important that each one of them is dedicated to their fight. Perhaps sometimes it's the same fight in different countries or in this in different area. But uh, do you believe that the impact would be much stronger if sometimes we don't divide the attention on many on many different entities and we group some under the same umbrella? Um, I do. I do think, but it's that that's a little bit different. Um, so. Uh, impact in the community to me is the is the is the success that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to show impact at a global scale. I know sometimes we'd like to believe it and we cobble numbers together. Um, but if the human, if the people can't feel the impact, then there is no impact. Mm -hmm. um, I don't care how you statistically show your numbers. Um, one of the things that we, uh, that, you know, that I created with Global Fund for Women is an accountability program with uh, UN Women and um, the Generation Equality Forums that happened in 2021, I believe. Um, and part of that was to say, um, you can't have governments or corporations, multinational corporations say and commit to something. And then when you ask them if a year later, if they've actually done that, did they have impact? They're like, yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we had impact. A lot of them will just say stuff like, oh, I, we committed a billion dollars and we spent a billion dollars. And you're like, but is that impact? And so what we asked is, um, and what we've gotten support from other donors to do, uh, to partner with us on is actually ask the people who are impacted by the challenges of the day. So if we're talking gender justice, let's just say climate justice, um, you know, violence against women. Who should we be asking if that impact is happening? Has there been impact? Have you felt any change? Um, we should be asking the people in the communities, the people that are actually the recipients of those challenges and trying to deal with them. And so we actually started a program where uh, we are we now have built some capacity among um, organizations, research and otherwise around the world to actually answer the question. So I don't know, let's just use an example. Government of Sudan said that they committing $10 million to, uh, you know, violence against women. Then the question is not to the Sudanese government. Did you spend that money, which is impact, but it's to the women. Did you feel any change because of the money that was spent? And so I think if we start thinking about it that way, I think impact will start to have a new meaning. Um, in the women's funding world, we get tired of the word impact because the way that people are using it is actually has nothing to do with the communities. It has everything to do with numbers and dollars and cents. Um, and what we're trying to overemphasize is the impact it has on the people who are experiencing the challenge. And so I think we have to just be laser focused on what that, what impact means and ask the right people whether mm -hmm. impact has happened. Thank you. Uh, this was not a planned question, but I had to <laughs> because I've been, I've been speaking with many activists as well and organization here in the UK. And sometimes uh, maybe they're, obviously they're on a smaller scale, but mm. uh, the sensation that they have is sometimes there are too many entities focusing on the same issue and maybe gathering them together to make them stronger, to have a bigger and more important impact rather than just, I don't know, ticking the box of, yes, we did this, we used this money, we implemented this, but actually then people on on, on the ground, they're still not seeing any results. So um, it's a bit, uh, depending obviously on the, on the field where you are, but getting together, like we said before, you know, having the support of, of your community, obviously we make the, the effort bigger and, uh, you know, the, the changes will be more efficient as well, I think. I guess, and, and you know, and I, I agree. And I know there are, like when we were with, when I was with Planned Parenthood at PPFA, I think when we went in there were like 200 and something affiliates in the US. And then I, I ran the global side. So, you know, the international side, but on the, the domestic side, that went down to something like 60, you know, mm -hmm. over a period of like 10 years. And certainly there was some strength in that, you know, sort of, um, 
collaborating and partner on, on, on the back end while still being a local partner to their communities. And I think that was brilliant. It went off and it probably would, you know, for folks that are saying this, it would probably be an example of how that can, um, you know, could be a model for how we work with NGOs so that they can come together. But the reason I talked about impact to the community and how we hold ourselves accountable to the community is because the question is not how many um, organizations are doing the same things with the same communities, but what is the impact they're having on the community? And so this is a question I'm saying we have to ask to the community. It's not just a, a numbers game. It's not just a efficiency game. It's about, are we actually addressing what the needs of that community are? So if we talk about survivors of sexual abuse. Um, it is not a think tank, Bridge Banner or, you know, McKinsey or something that needs to decide, oh, if all of these 20 organizations came together, put all their money together, then they'd have a bigger impact. No, the question is to the community of survivors is, are these organizations in their current format actually, you know, helping with the resources that you need as survivors, or would you think some other kind of format? And I know that for years, and hopefully that's changing, asking those questions, uh, you know, would be it would be termed as well, they don't know, you know, we're the experts. And I, I push back on that because I absolutely, you know, my mother was a, and I think if you've read the book, you saw, um, you know, actually experience violence and, uh, you know, domestic violence. And I look at how she's turned herself around and there are millions of her who can right now tell you, you know, how that happened, what was useful for them, how that looked, what didn't work for them. Mm -hmm. And I think if we just, try to lean into that more and stop considering ourselves um, experts and think of ourselves more as facilitators, um, think of ourselves more as conduits, amplifiers, and even to me, leaders, right? You know, because that's mm -hmm. to me what a leader does. Um, and ask those questions and listen to the answers and move based on what we've learned. I think we have more accountability and it, 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 it actually makes those kind of decisions of what I just said around Planned Parenthood happen because your drive is not some artificial definition of impact, but your drive is how, how accountable you are to the communities you work for. A chapter is about to close for you, which is, we, we you said at the beginning, but we mentioned it throughout the interview and is that uh, it's closing the chapter of the Global Fund for Women for you and mm -hmm. you're starting a new, a, a new one with the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. And uh, my question is, what... Do you think was the most uh, significant achievements that when you had with your leadership with the Global Fund for Women? Um, that's a great question. I've been, of course, talking about this a lot as, as I'm moving forward. Um, and I did talk a little bit about the movement-led approach because, you know, understanding the role of philanthropy as following social justice impact is, is a phenomenal way of thinking about things. Most of my career, whether it was at the UN, USAID, or with foundations has been, we'll come up with a plan to make you people do better. <laughs> and my, my, um, just that, you know, I'm almost 30 years in this work now. And what I've seen is the opposite. It's like, they need to tell us what they need in order to move forward. And my predecessor is going to talk, um, my successor, sorry, my successor will uh, talk more about this in her tenure, but what we started was an opportunity to actually look for movements when they needed us most. What we knew for sure was that when movements are emerging, when things, because usually it's a spark, right? Something mm -hmm. has happened, Some usually something tragic has happened and it makes people come together and they take to the streets, they take, you know, they take to their, their leaderships, their, their parliaments, their governments to try to change something that has happened. When those things are happening, usually the organization hasn't been formed yet, right? It's, it's a, it's a issue of happening around. I mean, it happens everywhere all the time, to be honest, but when it's happening, that's when the input of resources is the most useful to try to get them from emerging um, mass kind of um, work that's happening and organizing to something that then can be sustainable and continue that work and adds for a particular um, uh, uh, outcome. And in order to do that, you do need resources, but it's also at the same time that none of those people are actually sitting down, going online saying, well, who's funding this kind of stuff, right? It's 
you know, it's the opposite. We should be looking for them. And I'm glad at Global Fund for Women and um, a, a one of the, the just many, because we don't have time. I'm so proud of so much at Global Fund for Women. But one of the many things is that we've started the Gender Justice Data Hub that does this exact thing. We're actually tracking when movements are emerging. We're actually contacting them through advisors that we've been working with, who are mostly, you know, um, you know, graduated grantee partners, and we're we're working with them, saying, okay, we look through all the public information using AI and all that's available to us, um, social media, and we see that something is about to happen in this place, this region, this country, this community. Um, are there organizations that are working on this that we can connect with the movement, um, you know, the, the the organizers of these movements so that they can get resources, if we can give resources or if other donors can give resources to bring that in at a time when they actually most need it, I think would be um it's just going to be groundbreaking, and I can't wait to see how that continues at Global Fund for Women, because I, I know that there are a number of us that, um, including donors to Global Fund for Women, we're a public foundation, who, you know, continue to support and stand by organizations, but we also now need to be ready to ante up when something new is coming and to make sure that this new um breed of organizing of social justice gets the support they need to continue to do that work um, and to hopefully lead us to successes even faster in the work mm -hmm. that we're doing. And we're looking forward to see yes. what the future holds for, <laughs> yes. for the Global Fund for Women. Um, talking about your book, um, we you said what inspired you to write it briefly. Uh, if you want, you can tell us a little bit more. But uh, I would like to know, you know, when you were writing this book, what you wanted the readers to take away while yeah. reading it? And what the interesting thing say? is the, the title that we came up with, um, you know, because it's, you know, and it's in the business section of the bookstore. So it almost looks like it's a, you know, it's a conversation on how to be a good feminist, right? You know, um, it actually is nothing like that. And probably I would say out of the, the eight or nine spotlighted um, women that I put in the book, um, not even half of them would call themselves feminists. I mean, they might consider it, but they probably don't um, in whatever region or country they live in. Um, and, 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 you know, and the thing is that what I was trying to do was to talk to supporters of this kind of work. And I use the everyday feminist as a way to get some attention to the, the women who are doing this work who don't do it for the glory, who don't have their stories told very often. I mean, I do have Tarana in there. I have Loretta Ross in there, um, Tarana from Me Too, uh, Loretta Ross from the Reproductive Justice Movement. Um, but in general, the women in the book are, are not, and certainly the two of them before they became, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> famous. Um, it's not about their... Um, how they show up as individuals, but it's about how they had to shape something to bring attention to it and then to keep it moving. Um, you know, any one of these ladies in this book, including the young women that I spotlight could be presidents of a country just because of the way that they've had to engage around an issue and just completely change the way people think about it. Um, and that is the, that is the story, right? It's not I don't care if they ever became popular or famous, but it is how do we continue to tell this story, which is repeated? I mean, these people don't know each other. These these are women from different parts of the world. At the beginning of the book, I talk about um, Innocent, who's a hairdresser in Kenya, again, could be the president of Rwanda easily. I mean, it's, it is this Thing that they do and that they have that we need to look at not just as a fluke because it's happening too much around the world, but as an actual resource to make change happen. And I call it transformative change. And so we actually need to be on the lookout for these type of people in communities who are doing this work. And then we need to um, we need to support them. So that's the whole theory behind the book is like, what is that change that we're looking for? Who is making that change happen? How do we find them? And then how do we continue to support them? Not at so minimal level. And I talk about things that stop us from doing this too, right? You know, it's like, 
this whole concept around only funding people you know or that look like you or thinking people in the global south are not as educated or you know all of these kind of ridiculous things that we've had to overcome um but but really trying to truthfully partner with communities and the leaders and particularly women leaders in those countries to make sure that we're um I, you know, I'll even use, you know, making a, a impact that is sustainable. Mm. I'll use those words. <laughs> I I think it's a, it's a really beautiful book. And it's also a very interesting perspective, perspective on feminism to try yes. to reframe it a bit as it, I, I believe in the past years as either being stereotyped as a, you know, feminists are just ugly women that, you know, <laughs> they are fight, they are arguing with everyone. Yeah. Or, and it's just to make it look, as you say, not everyday feminists, like everyone can be. And you are not just, we are not feminists because we hate men or we hate. Right. We are it's feminists because we have a yeah. cause that we want to fight for. And yes. uh, it's yes. beautiful for that. It's just a different narrative, a different perspective. I I, I truly you. enjoy it. And um, if uh, none of the people that is, is listening to us today, is, if you haven't read it yet, please give it a try and it, it's a it's a beautiful book uh so thank you thank for you. you know sharing your network and and the women you met with us and their incredible stories i think it's quite inspirational um thank you writing a book is not an easy thing i guess no no and not why you have a day job like the global fund for women right exactly so <laughs> what what's your secret and <laughs> No, maybe not the secret, but also what advice would you give if someone that is listening to us today decided, oh, I would like to write a book and with a full-time job so uh, important, like the one you had, uh, share some uh, something for us. <laughs> Well, I, you know, listen, I, I, if I had to do it over again, I would probably do it differently. I was probably way too, I call it my sort of uh, COVID brain fog, you know? <laughs> so things like went crazy. I, you know, I've, I've had a career where I, you know, I've had the pleasure of being able to travel all the time um, and it, it just suddenly stopped, right? And so then, yeah, I've spoken to some of my colleagues at other organizations who felt like a book was a really good way of highlighting the work of an organization. And and that's how it kind of got started, that little seed in my head. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna write a book. <laughs> I've never written a book. I, you know, I, I just kind of jumped in without thinking, um, went out, got a publisher who gave me uh, like maybe a 11 month deadline to get the book in after we kind of discussed everything. And then I said, well, I'll take weekends and I'll do it. And the closer I got to the deadline, I was like, nowhere near finished. And, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, and, I, and I will say the thing that maybe put me over the hump was a couple of things, having the support of the board of the Global Fund for Women and particularly the chair who offered up a, um, a sabbatical, a three month sabbatical, a month of which was at the Rockefeller uh, Foundation Bellagio Center in Italy, of which um, the residence um, program there for artists, which include authors, was an opportunity to get support from a small group of people, I think we were 12, no, maybe 20, um, who offer you advice. Some of them had written like 20 books, right? <laughs> so they knew the process. And so it really was trying to, um, uh, you know, meet a deadline. I don't recommend doing it that way. It was very difficult, but I do recommend finding artist residencies like the Rockefeller Foundation. It was it was just such an incredible experience to have the gathering of expertise that I, I had that I was able to enjoy and just some time off to do it. You do need that. It's impossible to do while you have a day job. Um, but the other thing I would say is I think a lot of people do it the way of actually writing and giving yourself the time and space to write and then go look for a publisher, you know, and then you can clean it up and stuff, but you put, you know, your sort of you know, all your love and energy into something over a number of years. And then you found the publisher and then you started to move it into the world. That's probably a much easier um, pace, but I'm an everyday feminist. I, you know, <laughs> I was like, I, I can do this. Our way. <laughs> <laughs> the hard way is the better way, you know, and, and I, I jump right in and um, I don't regret it. And sometimes I even pick up parts of the book and wonder, you know, how how I did it in, in the space of time and with the the things that were on my plate. But I, I have to, and I am a um, spiritual person. So mm -hmm. I have to, I have to think it was just a God's way of, of, you know, putting something 
down that um, was important, not just for me, but I think for my organization and for the world. And are there any future projects or initiatives that are related to the book that you maybe would like to share or explore with us today? Is there going to be maybe another book, a second book? Well, here's the funny part. Stories? I said, so now I'm almost a year into the release date. So March 8th, and we're going to have a big celebration over at the City University of New York. Um, you know, I it actually launched over at Columbia University where I teach. Um, and then, but now we're going to uh, have the sort of one year anniversary is a much larger event over at um, the, the City University of New York. And, um, and I was thinking the thing I would say at that event was that I'm never going to write a book again. But the <laughs> closer I get to the event, the more I'm like sort of taking that out of my lexicon and changing, you know, my theory. So maybe, maybe there's something else in me. It would certainly be after I retire. Um, but uh, I, I do I do value what it has done, the conversations it started, the opportunity to meet so many amazing people around the world to have a discussion around um, what well, everyone knows. Once people understand what it means, everyone re relates to it because they know it's true. I don't care if it's just the PTA, you know, what we call the parent teacher association that's led by this amazing, maybe even sometimes obnoxious woman, right? But yeah. that's getting this amazing stuff done, you know, every year delivering, delivering um, that everyone understands it. And I think there's a relatable way of talking about it. So it doesn't sound so, uh, distant and that feminism doesn't sound like it's a sect of people that's out there, like you said, you know, hating men and arguing points around gender, um, you know, uh, and focusing on things that maybe are not so like pronouns and stuff, but but rather everyday things that people are dealing with around the world. So well, maybe. <laughs> let's see. Maybe, in a, I don't see. know, in five years' time, we're going to have another yeah. conversation. <laughs> That's next right, yes. Book or... We'll be talking about your book, though. Oh, maybe. Years. Let's <laughs> see. Let's see. You know, I always had an idea of that I wanted to write a book. And actually, my dad keeps telling me, he wrote a book himself. He keeps telling uh, me, when are you going to write yours? And I said, it's yes. not time yet. So let's see. Let's, see. let's, let's wait see for five that. years brings. Yes. And <laughs> all the stories from your podcast might make a book, right? Why, why not? Why not? <laughs> yes. Um, what are you most hopeful for the future of feminism and the feminist movements in general? We're going towards the end of this conversation. Mm -hmm. I want to finish on yeah. that. Yeah, or even more positive and inspirational. Yeah, way. no, I mean, I'm excited. Um, I, I am, you know, at this point, thinking a lot about what leadership looks like in the world. There was a story um, on, um, I believe it was CNN, of a town, I think it's in Missouri or something, where their entire city council and their mayor, um, so this is local politics, right? Mm -hmm. We're just voted in in November, so they started in January 1st. Um, and they're all women. And so I'm like, you know, um, this is going to be exciting. You know, no, you know, like in many countries, they have like these quotas and stuff like this. None of that. You know, they just were voted in. You know, they won. Um, and uh, they weren't like sort of nominated by someone because they had to nominate them. So I am just very interested in what's going to happen with this all sort of female council with the female mayor and, and what differences you can draw from that. Um, so from my perspective, this, this, it also, you probably know this though, this year is the first year in history with the most elections, yeah. national elections happening, right? So I think it's like 64 or 65 of them. And so I'm really interested in political leadership this year. I'm really interested to see what feminist leadership looks like, how we do at the ballot um, as a group. Like now, now I'm bringing you back to sort of mm -hmm. the much more global piece, of course, because you might end up with, you know, two, three of these you know, women winning and they're not that great. <laughs> you know, I, I want to be real. I mean, you know, just because it's a woman winning doesn't mean that it's great for their the communities. For their exactly. <laughs> I didn't want to say You sorry. said it, I did, not right. And you know? it's my own country. I, I, that's as right. much as I'm proud well, that's why of you can say it. Yeah. It's not her that we want. Well, yeah, I, I do know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but, but I'm thinking more of sort of this year has this opportunity to see 
And I'm, I'm a believer, I'm an optimist, many more women winning around the world. And then what does that look like for our movement around social issues? We already see some of it, right? We saw the best countries did, the, the countries that did the best during COVID were countries led by women. I mean, yeah. you know, hands down. Um, but now what does that look like when you have a much greater percentage of women running countries on, you know, whether it's public health issues, social justice issues or other things? And what does that look like? So if I sound excited about what's about to happen, I am. Um, I also am not naive and I understand the potentials of the, you know, the sort of fundamental, you know, is should I call them, you know, those on the far right and and things that they also have the potential to do but what i am what i am going to believe in and look forward to this year is how i can support feminist leadership political campaigns that are um, being uh, sought by women in in parts of the world uh, where i maybe can have some opportunity for my seat at rockefeller to be able to support that Hmm. We, um, I'm looking forward to 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 see how I, and to read more about this as well. And uh, yes. um, given your leadership role and obviously being involved in advocacy work and, and activism is can be quite challenging to balance self care and to prioritize mm-hmm. self care. So, what do you do personally to to for your well being? And what advice would you give to for all the women that you know are listening to us and maybe they they have a similar role or something? How can you keep yourself you know well and uh, in a, in such I, challenging position? Yeah, it's been. Um, it's actually I think this balance with family and and work and. And your position in life, you know, because that changes too, as you know, it's like not just your career, but sort of, you know, whether you're married or not, whether you have kids or not, and what, you know, what's happening with your elder parents and, and things like that. I think, um, you know, as folks who work hard also have to play hard. And so I think you have to, um, you know, my, my husband says that it's the feminine spirit, the masculine spirit, and then it's the child spirit. And I really... I really like that because this, I think we forget sometimes this child piece, you know, this piece of just letting, letting go, um, dreaming, playing just for no reason, hugging, um, doing things that, you know, you might have never done before uh, and, and, and relishing in looking forward to things that you've never done before. Um, So all of those things I think are going to be incredibly important to balance and to be honest with you, when it's not balanced, you see it. <laughs> so leaders, I mean, you don't think that if you don't take care of yourself, that it won't get noticed. It gets noticed. It is. It makes it difficult, not just for you, but for everyone around you. And so my advice is to really uh, play hard, you know, um, get out when you put the work down, you know, when you need to and and run into a you know hell a field of cotton candy or whatever but yeah get out and play hard so that when you show back up for these fights that you are you are ready and you are inspired so whatever it takes to do that i think is important and i don't think there's a prescription to that i see you know this is like oh do more yoga do more exercise do more this or that i think it just depends on the person and what makes you feel like you can get away and what makes your mm. child spirit comes out yeah. i love this oh <laughs> and do you have a word for your 2024 a word yeah oh that's a good one um <laughs> yeah uh, um i guess i'm going to have to use this word though because it's a uh, transforming so, um, so much has happened, right? So I'm changing jobs. Um, I have a, you know, my, my new husband, um, the, I'm an empty nester, which for those folks that don't know that term is that my, I, I no longer have the primary role of mother for anyone right now. They're all gone, um, from the home and doing their amazing things. Um, so those are, those are like, for me, the, the new things. So transformation is, um, is, is what I'll have to use for 2024. Well, Who am I without all those things, you know, <laughs> with, with these new things, the new job, the new husband, you know, I, I'm transforming into something that I don't know what it is yet, but I can't wait to find out. <laughs> you and you. Uh, that's, yeah, that's right. That's yes. beautiful. And to conclude this beautiful interview, uh, remember at the beginning, I asked you a question and mm-hmm. the one to wrap up everything is what is that you wish to stop fighting for? 
Um, that's, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I wish to stop fighting um, for identity and, you know, um, issues. So I, I know that sounds kind of weird, but this, the beauty of intersectionality, we talk about it a lot, right? You know, sort of these things that make people human, really. And we talk about it in the feminist movement enough. So you have like these, um, you know, counterbalancing um, identities uh, and those intersections then are often seen as um, challenges. I would love to stop fighting against that and actually lean into it. I think having you know, like an incredible array of both identities and um, intersections of those identities is what makes us such rich communities. It's what makes us um, incredible people to talk to. It was, it's what makes us, um, you know, like better than a social media account. You know, those are the things that um, I, I want to stop fighting against. Um, I have these multiple intersections and I think the, the I, you know, the intersection of them is what makes me beautiful. And so I wish we would stop talking about it like it's a problem, you know, and start leaning into it as more of a desirable condition. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, what a beautiful way to to end this conversation. Well, it's not end. I, I think it's that to be continued. Let's yes, yes. five years time. <laughs> find us. You have to bring way. us all together as a group and, and we Why get not? to Why hang not? out with each other. That's right. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. it was truly a pleasure to have you here on One Power Podcast, Latanya, today. I truly enjoyed this conversation. I hope everyone yes. that uh, listened today and tune in, uh, you had fun with us, you discovered something. Yes. and you feel inspired as I am uh, so thank you very much for being with us and thank you to Wimpower thank you for doing this I think it's so important <laughs>